I hope that everyone has already found the language that suits you best, that you will be using today to listen to our coordinators and presenters. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, in the Q&A session, and we'll try to help you. On behalf of the America House and American Spaces in Ukraine, I'm happy to welcome you all. Our right, today's event is taking place within the Black Sea Speaker Series program. It's a joint program with the support and, and co-organization with the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, U.S. Embassy in Georgia, and U.S. Embassy in Bulgaria that supported the America House in Ukraine. And today's event is organized by the America House in Kiev and in Lviv. I'm Lucy. Today I'm going to be your moderator, but I also have a co-moderator that's Volodymyr Bialo, and he's joining us from Lviv. Volodyu, hi. Perhaps you would also like to welcome our participants. Hi, Lucy. I'm very happy to join this important event today, and I'm very happy that we have uh, visitors and guests from such interesting countries who are going to join our presentation. Allow me to make a little bit of a deviation because we will be talking about civil society and civil public control. And as I remember those phenomena, I remember 2014, the year that is called a very important year in our history and the history of Europe. That's the biggest pro action of protest that took place under European banners in the world history. I think it became the point of do. It's a kind of a mirror that reflected all of the Ukrainian society. Today, when the Ukrainian society in the first weeks after the full-fledged invasion was able to self-organize so constructively to find its place and role in resisting the Russian aggression, we're called the ultimate Maidan. And that's when everyone supports the common goal and the values that we have had between 2014 and now. They're no longer declarative. They're not to be found on conventions, on the paper, or in highbrow discussions. They're real material values, and they're taking place right now and here. Freedom, civil society, community, and even Europe, that's not about bureaucracy, not about Wikipedia. That's about what is done, what is implemented by the Ukrainian civil society every day, now and here. I very much hope that the presentation from our speaker, Ivan, will once again confirm it. Thank you. Melodio, thank you very much for such a wonderful introduction for the future we have our interpreters today <laughs> so they can they should be able to catch up with you and to interpret so please be a little slower but very important things that you have mentioned and it's a very good introduction to our subject matter today why the session organized by ukraine focuses also on young people because we're talking about youth for change today, how young people carry out the change. And this is about how people all over the world work for change that they want to see. But specifically, we look at the Ukrainian experience because we have a long tradition of young people participating and changing our world, Ukraine, and I also believe all of the world for the better. Today, we will start with a presentation with our wonderful speaker, and I'm very happy to introduce you, Ivana Malchevska. She's the program coordinator of the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine. Ivana, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm very happy to join this project and tell you a little bit about how voluntary young youth community ozone helps us defend the country that we want to see even today i'm ivana malchevska coordinator of ozone public monitoring group the initiative of the center for civil liberties we will talk today about how public control and volunteers and young people can help us preserve democracy on an everyday basis as they do very simple things so let's start 
The Center for Civil Liberties is a human rights organization that was founded by Helsinki groups. And the main objective of the center is to promote human rights. We help reform legislature, uh, legislation so that they convey with human rights. We teach people democracy, human rights. We monitor the police, the courts, the uh, authorities, and we also engage rank and file people without any special education, because we do believe that ordinary people have much more power than they can imagine. You all know that in 2022, the Center for Civil Liberties received the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, and the Nobel Committee, in fact, uh, awarded that um, prize to the Ukrainian, Russian, and Belarus um, civil society organizations, because these people are a very good example of uh, how civil society work works in their countries. And the center received this award for human rights work and for being very active since 2014 in documenting war crimes committed by the Russian Federation. For us, getting the Nobel Peace Prize is not about, you know, friendship between our peoples. We're not brotherly nations. For us, this award, as Yevhen Sverstuk said, the famous Ukrainian dissident, that's about your and our freedom. Because human rights have no borders, just like solidarity, just like... Um, violations of human rights they don't have borders and ukraine feels that the organizations that we share this award with they are helping us today to work on uh, uh, prisoners of war on civilian hostages when we need to find a uh, civilian who has been taken hostage or prisoner either in russia or in belarus nobody can help us do it better than the russians or belarusians who know everything about their countries the Center for Civil Liberties is an organization that works thanks to broad support provided by simple people and volunteers who join our organization. And this picture that you can see, well, I have found it not accidentally. That's Olesya Matvichuk, who is holding this Ozan volunteer sweatshirt. And this is a very symbolic picture because the volunteers, the ordinary people who are joining us, they are the main force in all of our initiatives, starting with documenting war crimes that simple, ordinary people document and to end up with public control, because that's what simple students do, young experts who one day have decided to care and uh, to be conscientious people and to watch the authorities perform their functions. So, Ozon, Public Monitoring Group. This is the initiative of the Center for Civil Liberties. It's a volunteer initiative completely that brings together young people who carry out this public monitoring of the police, law enforcement, courts, and local self governments. And here you can see some pictures about the show our work. First is a monitoring of a Pride parade, the second, as we monitor shelters, because when the full scale war started, we started a national campaign to monitor shelters to see how the authorities provide defense and protection to the population. And the third picture was taken at a court hearing. It's an important picture because this is a prosecutor who is reading out a criminal code. And that case was heard with lots of violations. They wanted to have arrived at the judgment as quickly as possible. But when we heard about those brutal violations during the hearing, our volunteers started visiting the hearings. And eventually the judge and the prosecutor started working according to the algorithm and started reading the law by the letter. And that was a big victory for us and a good example of how ordinary volunteers can monitor the rule of law in the country. Azan works all over Ukraine. 
we have volunteers almost in every city and town. And uh, we do this public monitoring regardless, and we engage people regardless of what education people have, what experience they have. We teach them, we train them, because we believe that it's not only a special specialists who have studied law or international law very well who can perform public monitoring. It can be performed by any citizen of Ukraine and everyone is responsible for it. When we speak about public monitoring, it has been with Ukrainians since the very beginning. We can remember very many um, actions of protest and peaceful rallies that Ukrainians carried out to support some decisions of theirs or to help the authorities change some decisions that have already been made. Such a very widespread instrument of public monitoring among Ukrainians is actions of protest and peaceful rallies, peaceful assemblies. We can remember many of them important in our history. That's the revolution of granite, the orange revolution against election falsification, these are some more recent protests under the office of the president against the arbitrary policies of law enforcement and the protest uh, against the Nash Russian TV channel, which was eventually closed down, and a protest against the minister of education, who was suspected of plagiarism. Well, of course, the most important action of protest in the history of Ukraine was, of course, the Maidan, the Revolution of Dignity. And it became a breakthrough for all of us, regardless of whether someone went to the Maidan or watched Maidan on TV or just read the news or discussed it with the people next door. Maidan changed everybody. And it changed everybody in particular in three important areas. First, we understood our values. They crystallized in our minds. We understood our value of self-expression and we understood that we should unite uh, uh, to exercise civil control in order to avoid the situations when the police uh, shoot at people gathering at peaceful assemblies. And it requires continuous oversight and not only in critical situations. And thirdly, we understood that our state is our responsibility and it is our responsibility to build it the way we want to see it in the future. Oh, an outstanding example um, of uh, seeing how the people grow in Maidan we after Maidan was an activist and human rights defender Roman Ratoshne, a participant of Maidan. And after Maidan, he created an, an initiative group to protect uh, 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 the location in Kiev, Protasiv Yar, the green space. And he was a participant and initiator of a number of protests against uh, the uh, violence uh, com uh, committed against uh, uh, human rights activists and he always supported such initiatives and when on uh, February 24 uh, Russia started a large-scale war uh, on Ukraine Roman Justice and many activists uh, joined uh, the uh, territorial defense and then protected Kiev and died um, while uh, on a, a military mission uh, near Izum. And when I'm remembering Roman, it comes to mind that it was the great success uh, by Azon that it, uh, it was Azon that saved Roman's reputation. And uh, it is this story that I want to share with you today. So one day, ordinary students um, went to monitor a peaceful assembly near the president's office. Uh, that was when uh, it, the walls uh, were painted and vandalized in general. And it was our volunteers that recorded it. 
the um, all the damages that were caused and they uh, went home to write a report and in an hour or two after the end uh, of the protest uh, we uh, saw uh, a picture online with a swastika on uh, and this was the start of a uh, of a huge uh, discreditation campaign against the protesters and the whole all of the attention focused on why uh, this uh, protest started how activists uh, managed to draw a swastika uh, on the walls of the president's office and our activists hurried to publish a report that when they were there and recorded it there was no swastika on the walls and it was uh, this report that became a powerful argument to protect the organizers of the protest and Roman Ratushne himself uh, and when Roman uh, came to Schuster Live uh, TV program uh, it was the uh, Ozone monitoring group that documented that there was no swastika on the walls and here i have a rhetorical question but could you please tell if there were no our uh, volunteers our uh, grassroots independent uh, observers whether uh, the organizers of this uh, action uh, would have been justified Another story uh, that testifies to the importance of the civil oversight is Kharkiv Pride. We taught volunteers how to monitor. We uh, shared the algorithms and told what the police uh, can and cannot do and how to document violations. And quite accidentally, in 2019, the police decided to... Mm, hit and commit violence against the participants of Kharkiv Pride and uh, our volunteers documented it. This case went to court and our uh, volunteers uh, testified and so uh, it is our hope that the police officer who kicked the protester would be punished. So tell us please if there were no independent observers would this uh, case be in court now? Another example is uh, a rather new one, how we work under martial law. You can see uh, the photos uh, of bomb shelters in Ukraine. The first two photos show uh, two completely flooded uh, locations in Kiev, uh, there is no uh, subway uh, in, the, in those uh, neighborhoods. The third one uh, shows uh, the location that was locked up. So our monitors uh, go to those shelters and document such violations. And then they uh, give this information to the uh, city authorities and uh, the authorities react. They will also be sending uh, their officials uh, to those addresses uh, to see uh, the violations and to open them up because the civil defense must be ensured in properly. Another question again. If there were no independent uh, volunteers, monitors uh, that uh, hadn't recorded this uh, dire situations with shelters, would uh, the authorities take action and start uh, conducting checks and would that lead to positive changes? The question remains open. And all these examples are given to you to show the bottom line that is relevant for all Ukrainians, that public control uh, of the authorities helps keep um, the, them in uh, the fr uh, framework of democratic and quality service, because it is the duty of the state to provide quality of life. 
So if you want to preserve and keep democracy, use public control. And if you see that your authorities fail you, then you must exercise public control because it is the uh, common duty of the citizens. This is all from me. Thank you for your introduction, for the general overview of your activities and such interesting examples of how uh, young people pr participate, engage and take action. These are the things that every person can do and we witness uh, changes. So you started uh, your uh, work as a volunteer. Yes, indeed, but regrettably, I uh, wasn't aware of Azan's existence back then. So I joined uh, the local initiatives in Valin Oblast, where I come from. But when I learned about Azan, I felt the need uh, that uh, peace uh, in it because peaceful assemblies ca uh, could be suppressed and uh, police uh, could use violence against the peaceful protesters. And when I heard and learned about the things that people uh, in Azon do, I understand that, wow, this is something that all of us should do. Indeed, it's great that uh, we have such organizations where you can mm, join and find like-minded people to work together. I would just like to address our audience that uh, are with us remotely. Please leave your questions in our question and answer uh, section and we'll uh, answer all of those. And this is how uh, we will have a dialogue. And I would now would like to give the floor to Volodya. Uh, first of all, this, I had this pre uh, question about Roman and others. All this goes straight for the jugular, how the one picture can overturn everything. And we saw how even the doors became the focal point of TV shows. Yeah, the question is, we understand that volunteers uh, of a zone must be uh, as neutral as it's possible, but is it, does it become a stumbling block during the trainings? Are there any rules uh, uh, for the volunteers to work? Yes, our volunteers undergo uh, special trainings on how to act during peaceful assemblies. It is important to remain impartial. We have this rule that when all our volunteers participate as independent monitors, uh, they are tasked with documenting and uh, the situation and describing it precisely, but they cannot intervene. They cannot help anyone to provide grounds for their uh, opinion. So this uh, is our stance. We are present, but we do not intervene. Uh, I can tell more uh, on our training, so you can join in and I'll teach you. Um, sometimes it gets difficult because, uh, let's say, for example, Kiev Pride, and it may be difficult to remain uninvolved. And then the person joins um, the event as a participant, but not as a zone representative. Thank you very much. I see that we have a question uh, from the Q&A section. What does the name Ozone mean? Why exactly this name? This is a good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a pretty answer for you, Ozone. Uh, we had a variety of theories such as the ozone layer protecting the earth from those uh, harmful uh, radiation, but the name 
became symbolic because uh, if you know, the history of a zone started when we uh, took as an example, the um, civil monitors from Russia, they had uh, um, the group of uh, uh, civil oversight. And if I'm not mistaken with this name, and we looked at it and we understood that we need it, but we needed something truly Ukrainian of true quality. And that's why we uh, took a similar sounding name, Ozone, but let's think that this is the ozone layer. Uh, so we call our volunteers Ozonyevci. So, so the people who protect society from the abuse, from uh, a lack of quality in uh, public services uh, through monitoring of uh, government activities. Uh, this is a truly inspiring story uh, that uh, speaks to us all and, can, and we can inspire to be inspired by the activities in other countries and adapt it to our needs. And we have a question from the, our colleagues from Georgia, are there any requirements to people who become ozone volunteers? And another question from me, are there any international opportunities for volunteers abroad to cooperate with you? As for the requirements, um, again, you have to be conscious of your wish you have to understand why you want to be part of this civil control. And if indeed this understanding is uh, still flailing, then we will help you understand it better. You just need to truly understand that sometimes the activities and activism and volunteering takes up a lot of your time. And also the monitoring of peaceful assemblies is a difficult thing. And uh, sometimes you don't feel rewarded for it, but um, sometimes our volunteers stay and monitor for eight hours on end, but you have to sort of re remain there, stay there. You cannot uh, go anywhere because you're responsible for it during these eight hours. So yes, the most important requirement is to clearly understand one's work, to be ready to give your time for it, and as regards international possibilities. I know that in many countries they have their own monitoring groups that perform monitoring of peaceful assemblies, because the main objective of such groups is to make sure that uh, peaceful assemblies are free and this freedom would not be violated by counter assemblies who are against pride, for example, or by law enforcement or by the local authorities, because sometimes they can also impose limitations. So I would advise colleagues from Georgia to try to find such initiative groups in Georgia. But if not, you can always come to Ukraine and help us monitor the freedom of peaceful assemblies, the courts, and now to see how shelters are organized in Ukraine. Thank you. That's a very good remark that brings us to the next issue that we have received from Tbilisi, Georgia. How can you recommend us how to start such a project in our country? Whether you can give us uh, some advice about our first steps to take. Well, the first steps, well, like anywhere, you should find the people who would be ready to give a lot of their time to this work. Because any idea, even the best one, will definitely require resources and a lot of resources, human resources, emotional ones, knowledge. You really need a lot of resources. Find people, find a team with whom you would be ready to do it. Find an expert who would help you from the outside to better understand where to move and how to present your initiative. And start with simple things. You know this rule, the elephant should be eaten with in little pieces. So start with simple things. 
find a team, find an expert who would give you advice on the first steps and start taking those small first steps. And if you need any expert assessment or if you need our experience with Ozon, we're always happy to share our experience about how we started working back in 2013. So just write to us. If you don't mind, we have also a question from the audience in Lviv. Has anything changed in the, war, in the work of the courts and judges since the start of the war and the specificity of their work? Or are you now paying most attention to the war crimes only? Well, no court hearings keep continuing and they really focus a lot on war crimes and crimes against humanity but the courts keep functioning what has changed since the start of the full-scale war what we have noticed and sometimes it was kind of a funny when there was a lot of shortage of electric power all over the country the courts would not work in fact well they would have their agendas you know to say what hearing would start at what time but when we come to the courthouse to monitor the hearing to see how the courts would work during the war the judges would not come to the court the secretaries would not come to the court there would be only the guards who would say we have no electric power so come tomorrow that's what has changed so they have become a bit relaxed, I would say. We have had situations, well, at least one situation that we're definitely aware of because we monitored it. When there was a case of two men from Belarus who were accused of communist propaganda, they wanted to hear that case very quickly and to judge them in order not to take their time and not to do it according to all the legal algorithms, which was not correct. Because we understand they were short of time and there are much more urgent cases, but we have the rule of law, regardless of the martial law. And we have to investigate all the cases with good quality and work with good quality in the courts. That's why I was very grateful to our monitors who went to that case of the two bent from belarus and made the judge and the prosecutor read out the criminal code do everything according to the legal algorithms you force the prosecutor to read out the criminal code that's a good achievement i see there is another question from georgia yes i will read it out you've touched upon this subject how azan works in the situation of the martial law since the beginning of the war perhaps starting with 2014 but especially now after the 24th of february 2022 have you had any complications any new difficulties in your work because of that of course we we have had them in particular on the 24th of february we did not understand whether public monitoring and public oversight would still exist in the country that has to have this war, the war coming from the north, from the east, and from the south. We did not understand whether our work would be allowed by the authorities, whether it would not be a threat to national security. So for about four months, the first month after the start of the full-scale war, we did not perform our classical you know, jobs uh, to monitor peaceful assemblies or the courts because there were no peaceful assemblies. We didn't understand whether the judges kept working mostly. The courts were frozen. We did not monitor the local authorities. And I think that would also be in the way for them because they had to provide civil protection to the population. However, as we are a volunteer community and a youth community, we were very flexible. And Ozan volunteers joined the process of documenting war crimes. Since the very first days, already on the 25th of February, the volunteers joined this process, documenting the shelling, 
and then uh, how civilians were taken hostages or prisoners. We now have a group of Ozon monitors who are only working with civilian prisoners who document all such cases. I think that this is a an issue that can be continued if we broaden, if we bring it up to an international level. We understand that documenting can be used by the international courts and tribunals. But talking about multiplying the experience of ozone and how your international contacts, international work has changed. What can you say about that now? That's a very good question. Let me answer it with a story. In April, Ozon could go to an OSCE session where they gathered public monitoring groups from European countries. And there were people from France and Germany and other countries. Uh, we all talked about the freedom of peaceful assemblies and how we should engage young people in uh, this public monitoring process. And two of our representatives from Ozon, it was myself and Katya, a volunteer, we started saying that, first of all, Ukraine, even during the martial law, remained an example for many European countries in terms of providing peaceful assemblies and uh, how our dialogue police works and how our public oversight works. Because in almost all of the countries, they have this kind of a dialogue police that during peaceful assemblies, it provides preventive work to prevent conflicts. So when the police can see two persons, for example, who can start clashing between themselves or would start, you know, a brawl, they would interfere and by mediating this conflict, they would prevent it. And it so happened that even during the martial law, the dialogue police in Ukraine is more effective than in many European countries. Because over there, the dialogue police starts communicating with the participants of the peaceful assemblies at the time when they're about to start clashing. And that is much more difficult to prevent such clashes. While our dialogue police works in such a way that in fact, there are no clashes or fights, well, uh, except for such actions of protests that are very hot, what happened by the office of the president. But remember, the protesters would not be allowed to come close to the office. So that's about scaling up our experience. I think that many European colleagues have to learn lessons from our volunteers and from the dialogue police. And we are always very happy to share our experience because violations of human rights have no borders. That's why solidarity has no borders. And we are ready to work with our colleagues from other countries. Thank you, Ivana. We have uh, started speaking a little bit about what young people do in your organization in general. And uh, we brought up such difficult subjects, especially when monitoring war crimes. And there is a question from our audience in Tel Aviv in Georgia. Do you have any age limit as regards the volunteers who come to you? No, we don't have an age limit, but historically, it has so happened that uh, the most active participants, the people who join us, are really young people at the age between 18 and 30 maximum. Now, when we have started monitoring civil defense, when we monitor the situation with the bomb shelters and shelters, we see that even older audience is ready to join our volunteers. And in fact, the oldest volunteer that we have today, she's 72. She is from the city of Chernihiv. But in general, Ozon is mostly a youth movement. But one important thing, the only limitation is you have to be of age. Well, I understand. 
Well, that's a very good story of your 72-year-old volunteer. And that's a very good example about how different generations can work together for one goal. We have uh, more questions. A question from our colleagues in Tbilisi, from our audience. The question is, what difficulty, difficulties did you have at the beginning of your work, and, uh, when you just started that work of Ozon, or when you would start some new activities? At the beginning of our road, Ozon, faced some difficulties because at that time it was you know more a way when we were just trying the by trials and errors what would work well but it's a road of any startup of any project that is only starting it's trials and errors you have to look for the areas where you can be effective when you can work well it's hard for me to remember and story of some difficulties but what is easy to remember is our victories when we first started monitoring peaceful assemblies and the court hearings the trials and the effect of our presence really affected it really affected the work of the police at the rallies it really affected the work that judges and prosecutors behave for example when maidan cases were heard and some of them are still uh, at the trial stage, but very often with no people come to the courtroom, where there are no independent observers or people who just come to a hearing, people who may not be independent monitors, but just people who are interested, who care. So when nobody comes to the hearing, then the judge may not give the floor to the uh, defendant or to the witnesses and uh, sometimes you know work in an arbitrary way but when ordinary people come to the courtroom or where our volunteers come to the courtroom then the hearing becomes completely different the judge knows at once what one should do according to the law and how the case should be heard and the prosecutor knows what to say and how to work they know what criminal code is what it says that's why it is true i think that uh, this public oversight public control has more success stories in some more than problems i can tell you how we started with the monitoring of civil protection facilities in ukraine most of ukrainians are engaged in volunteering helping uh, the military, helping uh, to rebuild Ukraine, helping with the things. But the civil protection facilities, it, it is harder to engage young people in uh, monitoring of uh, shelters. And sometimes there is misunderstanding on the part of uh, local authorities when they say that we did everything uh, really well. Why should we, mon uh, should we get monitored? So um, all this, uh, these things, uh, they uh, talk about national security and other things not to let us there. Now we are facing the situations where we cannot monitor the state of facilities in educational and medical institutions. Uh, the administrations did not let us uh, in because we don't have the right of access. And this is the difficulty we're trying to cope with. But this is the start of the dialogue with the uh, with the state and this these are your expectations of what the state should provide uh, these things can be uh, smaller and uh, this leads me to another question from the audience because sometimes it can be just dangerous so in these cases are there any ways to convince monitors uh, the volunteers that they will be safe or maybe there are some practices how you ensure safety of volunteers 
This is indeed an important question, the safety of volunteers. In our activities, we are governed by the uh, OSCE practices, and we have key rules uh, that uh, are inviolable for everybody, whether it's someone with a lot of experience under their belt or maybe some, uh, someone new. These are basic rules that can be used by everyone. This is the main thing. The monitoring is carried out by two or more persons. We uh, never go out alone. And even if there are peaceful assemblies and we are going to monitor them, and if we know that it will be hot and active, uh, and there might be fights, uh, we always... Uh, stay uh, in groups of two at least so that uh, we can help each other or signal that because two can cope with the difficult situation, dangerous situation a lot better than a person on their own. We always uh, notify our headquarters. We do have a headquarters. The person uh, that knows uh, where we go, uh, who we are with, uh, we switch on uh, GPS services so that they know where we are. This is one thing that when, some, uh, when the assembly is dangerous and when you may be uh, taken in by the say by the police it's not practiced here in ukraine because we have a uh, civil uh, control here but these are the basic things that can save you so you need at a guidance from headquarters if you're going somewhere dangerous you should uh, have someone who uh, is always online always keeping in contact wearing headphones and as uh, Georgian uh, colleagues uh, talked about their own initiative, if you're worried that uh, the activities of such an initiative could be dangerous for the volunteers, uh, you could engage uh, other um, public volunteers, uh, civil rights activists that, uh, for example, if somebody wants to discredit you or um, you, uh, your office will... Uh, uh, be subject to, to searches, then yes, there will be someone uh, someone staying with you. These are uh, this is practical advice, but really effective. Um, so, uh, Volodya, maybe you could continue. I have a short question because when we're talking uh, civil control, we're talking control over. Uh, the government, as in the courts, administrations, the police. But uh, well, since uh, we are uh, on uh, the side of law, but uh, were there any cases when the uh, when the ozone had to protect that truth that was on the side of the government, on the administration? Yes, uh, that, uh, I need to think about it. Indeed, uh, what is happening today is quite an interesting uh, situation. So uh, take, for example, the monitoring of shelters, um, uh, bomb shelters. So when we first started it, uh, we thought that uh, uh, we will be uh, facing uh, the uh, um, the authorities that it won't be the people living in those high rises and people. But in fact, the authorities were uh, on our side, uh, and uh, the city administration, say in Ternopil, uh, came to us and said that uh, they were really grateful to us because they didn't have the. Um, uh, powers to exercise this control and to force uh, the those um, owners of the shelters to provide and comply with uh, the requirements. And this uh, this is uh, why we were on the side of the authorities because they can be um, uh, in a state property, communal property, or private property. Because again. Uh, no one can force uh, can force those uh, p owners 
to open them up, to arrange uh, them. And, uh, and this is uh, how uh, we joined uh, forces with the authorities to make these uh, bomb shelters accessible to people. This, Ivana, is a great example. And here we have the question from the audience. Are there any projects or um, activities uh, that your organization would like to start uh, with, but um, couldn't because of the current situation? As for Ozone, we uh, were really preparing uh, in March to monitor prides all across Ukraine in Lviv, Odessa, and Kharkiv, in Kiev. But regrettably, uh, we couldn't do it. We were halfway there. We even planned the trainings for uh, volunteers, and the first training was scheduled for March 1st. But um, regrettably, uh, it didn't happen. So we ha don't have any activities that we haven't started yet. But we do have those activities that somehow got stalled because of the martial law and the freedom of peaceful assembly is an extremely important thing. And it is important to, uh, that we do have peaceful assemblies, that they are allowed, that they are not banned. And we want to focus on this more and more and to show to our European colleagues uh, that uh, Ukraine remains democratic and independent uh, despite the martial law currently in place and we ensure the freedom of peaceful assembly. And it is my opinion that uh, this is uh, the activities we want to uh, again, take up again. As for the Center of Civil Liberties, uh, we are very flexible. We started documenting war crimes since 2014, and it went hand in hand with our project. But now this activity came to the fore, and we understand that how extremely important it is to document war crimes today. And when the conditions change, when we get more uh, freedom to do more projects, then we will launch them. But now we're focusing on the essential things. Yes, we do have a lot of work ahead of us. We have a lot of questions. So young people come to you, their parents, do they come to you too? Are they against it? Do they try to stop their children from coming and joining to you? Uh, yes, we do have parents who comment uh, our, uh, our posts on Facebook they are quite supportive. Another question, are there any situations uh, uh, when your volunteer somehow violated the rules or acted inappropriately? Uh, we, do, uh, we did have one case when during a peaceful assembly, our volunteer um, uh, wasn't uh, impartial and uh, she um, again joined uh, the communication of the participants of the counter assembly so and it was uh, again uh, and it happened that uh, she protected uh, she, the uh, position of the those who uh, came to the peaceful assembly and we again released a public statement we uh, um, uh, apologized and we stated that we will uh, further on remain unbiased and impartial. Thank you, Ivana. We do have a lot of questions and thank you to all our participants uh, for asking questions, but we need to wrap up. So, uh, Valodia, the floor is yours. I have to ask this question from uh, Varna, Bulgaria. I think that everybody has uh, their own answer, and I think uh, this is a good finale. How can we motivate young people to actively engage in the development of civil society? So, in your experience, from your experience, how is that possible? I think two options. First is to lead by example. 
I mean, quality example, maybe not the personal example, but example of other people. And the second is open communication, frank communication. What we did uh, did in 2014, this is our state, this is our responsibility. And if we want to, ha if, uh, to have the state that uh, uh, embodies our, our vision, then this open, frank communication with volunteers uh, encourages them to continue their work in other uh, volunteer organizations. Thank you very much. So go and do it. This is the bottom line. Uh, thank you, Ivana. Thank you, Valodia. Thank you to our audience for tuning in and joining this important conversation. It was my honor and it was my joy to share this evening with you, to talk about Ozon, to talk about the Center of Civil Liberties, to talk about Ukraine, despite all the challenges and its young people continue to work for positive changes. And I invite you uh, for further, uh, to further events, the Black Sea Speaker Series. Uh, I remind you that we uh, work in uh, Georgia, Bulgaria, um, and again, uh, we uh, work everywhere around uh, the Black Sea. So uh, see you soon and have a good day.